All right, great. So thanks, everyone. Very full room today. That's cool. Um, so I, I'm Adam Wolf Gordon. I work on the storage team at DigitalOcean. I work mostly on our uh, block storage orchestration layer, the management system for our block storage volumes. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, unit testing in Go, specifically about unit testing with mocks and some situations where it's maybe not easy to unit test with mocks and strategies that I've found useful uh, in my day-to-day -day work for uh, dealing with these situations. So I want to start with uh, some audience participation. That seems to be all the rage at this conference. Uh, so quick show of hands. Who's written a unit test in Go? All right, most of us. Good. Almost everyone writes tests. That's good. Uh, who's written a unit test using uh, mocks or some other kind of test double? And if you don't know what that means, that's OK. I'll explain it in a second. All right, good, good number of people. How many of you have uh, avoided writing tests for a piece of code or just not tested a piece of code? because building the mocks was just hard or seemed like too much work. Yeah, I've, I've done that, for sure. So that's what this talk is about, is those situations and some ways that we can uh, make it easier, make the mocks work better for those situations where it's not easy to mock things. So I'll, I'm going to give a, a quick kind of overview of mocks for people who maybe haven't worked with them before first, and then we'll get into the, the meat of the talk. So what are mocks? Uh, in the software engineering literature, there's a definition of mocks, which is they're a specific kind of test double, a kind of test double that does behavior verification. And Martin Fowler's definition is on the slide. It's a nice definition of it. Um, more generally, a test double is an object that you can inject into tests uh, that lets you control the behavior of your dependencies. And when I talk about mocks in this talk, I'm really uh, talking about any kind of test double. I, the techniques that I'm going to talk about today work for other kinds of test doubles other than mocks, uh, like fakes or stubs or et cetera. Um, that said, I, I, the examples that I'm going to use will use uh, things that really are mocks, and I'm in particular going to use uh, auto-generated mocks. We'll see how that works. So why do we use mocks? Um, the num number, a few reasons. Number one, they let us decouple our code from the real world when we're testing it. Um, we're going to avoid doing network calls, touching uh, our operating system, doing file system things. And the reason we want to do that is it makes our tests reliable. Uh, it lets them run in different environments, makes them independent of where you're running them, and uh, makes sure that you're testing your code and not testing a bunch of external things. Uh, related to that, it, it lets us run our unit tests without running any dependencies. So if you have code that uh, does queries on a database, for example, if, you're, if you can mock out that database, you don't have to run the database when you're running your unit tests. That's not to say that you shouldn't also have integration tests where you do run the database. Uh, you should have both. <laughs> But uh, you want to be able to run your unit tests really fast in any environment. You don't want to have to set up the time you're running unit tests. And the most important thing, I, I think, for mocks is they let us force uh, error conditions that are hard to simulate. Uh, the error cases in your code don't run very often in production because things usually work. But it's important that they work properly when they do run. And it's really hard to force them to run uh, if you're using a real dependency. So thinking about it, uh, an application that talks to a database again, um, if it does two queries, it's really hard to force the database to succeed on the first query and then fail on the second query. Right? It's hard to do that reliably. But that situation can happen in production, so you want to test the code that handles that. And with mocks, you can force that series of events to happen. You can make sure that you're testing all of those cases. So if you want to get anything close to 100% test coverage, you really have to use mocks or some kind of testable to get rid of those external dependencies. So I've got uh, an example here just to show how mocks work. Um, here's a, a function that lets you get your IP address. And it calls out to an external service, ICANHasIP.com. And it parses what it gets back from that website uh, into a, a, an IP address in Go um, and, and does some checks. I, and I, we can write a test for this. Um, we call it a function. We make sure that it isn't returning an error. We check that we get something back from it. There we go. We've got a test. There's some problems with this test. Um, number one, what happens if the website is down? The test is going to fail. And it's not a problem with their code. It's just a problem with the website. We shouldn't fail a test any time the, the website goes down. Right? We're not trying to test the website. We're trying to test our code. Uh, the other problem is we're not making a very strong assertion about what we get back from our code. Um, we're not testing that the parsing actually works properly, that we get an error if the website returns garbage. Um, all we're asserting is that we get something back. And the reason for that is we don't know what our IP address is. We can't put in 
uh, an assertion there for what the result should be. So we can solve both of these problems with mocks. To make this code more testable, we need to modify it a little bit. Uh, we're going to break the caller provide a getter. And the getter is this interface that we've defined uh, on the other side of the slide there that has a single method in it uh, called get that knows how to get a URL. And you'll notice that uh, the HTTP client type from the Go standard library satisfies this interface. So in production, we can provide it to our function, and it'll use just the, the normal uh, get. It'll be basically just like we had on the previous slide. Um, and this is a standard technique called dependency injection, where you have the caller provide your dependency. That way, you can replace it for tests. And it's also a nice pattern, because in this case, it lets the caller decide if they want a timeout uh, for their HTTP client or uh, other things like that. So I said at the beginning, we're going to use, um, we, you could use various kinds of test doubles for this. But in this talk, I'm going to use mocks. And I'm going to use mocks that are auto-generated. Um, I generate mocks using a tool called Mockery. Uh, Mockery generates mocks that use the testify mock library. Um, and I like this library. I like how it works. But um, it's kind of up to you what, what kind of style you like for mocks. Um, so this is how we, we call Mockery to tell it to generate us a mock. We tell it that we would like a mock for our HTTP getter type. And it spits out a bunch of code, which I've uh, trimmed here so that it fits on the slide, because we don't really care that much about it. But what we do care about is it gives us a struct, this mock HTTP getter, that you can see embeds uh, the mock type from the mock package. And that's the struct that's going to let us control the behavior of this mock. Uh, you can also see it has the, the get method, so it satisfies the interface, uh, does what we expect. So we can set up this mock in our unit test by creating a, a fake response that we want to get back from when we do the get. And then we create a, a mock getter, uh, just an, an instance of the thing that we have on the left. And we're going to tell the getter that when it gets a get request with that URL, I can't have it, .com, it should return our fake response that we've constructed. It should return a nil error. And it should do that once. We expect the code is going to call it once. And if the code calls it more than once, then we're going to get a panic. If it calls it less than once, we can check for that, and we can make sure that the code is doing what we expect. Uh, and we can set up error conditions the same way. Um, so you can see it's ex exactly the same. Just we, instead of providing a response and a null error, we provide a, an error. So here's what our, our test looks like now. I, I have the original code on the left and the, the test body on the right. Um, we create the mock getter, just like we did on the previous slide. We tell it to return a response. And now when we call our uh, get IP function, we can <laughs> assert that it's not going to return an error. We can assert exactly what we think we're going to get back. And we can make sure that that parsing works. We can make sure the whole thing works as expected. Um, and you can see we, we could write uh, failure cases exactly the same way. We can test for uh, IPv6 addresses, or if the website returns garbage, or any number of different things that we want to be able to handle. Uh, we don't have to uh, rely on the, whatever the service is going to return to, to do it. So. Uh, with that out of the way, kind of everyone has a, a basic understanding of how mocks work now. Uh, some dependencies are easy to mock. Um, the, there's a few properties that contribute to this. Uh, one is that they export interfaces or structs that have methods so that we can wrap them in an interface, like we just saw on the previous slide. Um, this gives you kind of a natural way to inject the dependency and a natural way to generate your mock. Uh, it, all the Go mocking tools that I've seen, like, uh, like Mockery, kind of rely on having an interface to generate a mock for, uh, which makes, makes sense. It's, it's a natural thing to do in Go. Uh, another thing that helps is if the return types for the, the methods in your dependency are fairly simple structs, because then you can construct a fake one easily uh, to return when you're uh, setting up your mock. Um, it, it's tricky if you have a, a return type that has some data fields, and then you also need to call some methods on it. And you have to figure out exactly which data fields to fill out so that the methods will do what you expect. Uh, that makes it add some complexity to this. And uh, finally, easy to mock dependencies don't use CGO. Uh, CGO complicates everything. I'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute, but that's it's just a, an additional complication. So for example, uh, the net HTTP package that we saw in the, the simple example is a, a pretty nice, easy dependency to mock. It actually provides some utilities uh, itself in the HTTP test package for um, 
helping you sort of mock it out. Um, it, it has the client type that's, that's easy to wrap an interface around. Um, the, the response types are, are pretty simple. It's, it's a fairly easy thing to mock. Conversely, uh, some dependencies are hard to mock, and that's what this talk is about. Um, there's a few things that contribute to this. One is that if, it depend, if some library that you're using has a lot of free functions, so functions that are not methods on structs or methods in interfaces, um, there's no natural way to inject those into your code. So that, that makes it hard to mock that dependency. Uh, same with, uh, as I said before, if you have a, a response types or return types that are complex, that have lots of data, method, data fields and, and methods that depend on them, it can be hard to create a fake version of that, and that makes it harder to mock a dependency. And uh, the, the last thing is Cgo. Something that I've seen with Cgo is that if you have a C struct embedded in a Go struct, uh, it's really hard to artificially construct that without actually calling the dependency to initialize the, the C structure, uh, depending on, on what library you're using. Uh, so that's, that's something that makes it uh, fairly difficult to, to mock that kind of dependency. So one example is the OS package in the standard library. Um, it, almost all of the functionality in the OS package is in uh, package level functions. So like the, the host name function, the create function, open, mictor, all of these functions that you call from the OS package. Um, and these functions all return complex things. For example, uh, if you call os.open, you, what you get back is a file. And the file type is pretty much impossible to construct artificially, right? It has a, a file handle in it, it's not easy to kind of fake one of those out to return from a mock. Um, and it, it doesn't use Cgo, I don't think, but it does do system calls, and those are complex things. You don't want to actually do them in real life. So it, it's a hard dependency to mock, and to make things worse, it's one of those things that you actually really want to mock out, because you don't want your tests to do actual file I.O., or look up your actual host name, or any of the other things that OS can do. Um, you'd like to control the returns from those when you're writing unit tests. So it's kind of a, a, a compounded problem where the thing that you really want to mock out is actually kind of hard to mock. So the rest of this talk is devoted to techniques that I've found useful for mocking things that are not easy to mock. And I've got examples for each one. Um, and, and one thing I want everyone to keep an eye out for is that I, these techniques are, are not sort of mutually exclusive. They can be combined. <laughs> Uh, sort of composed for dealing with whatever your unique situation is in your application. Um, and they, we'll see at the end a, a little example of how you can compose them. Uh, they're also not one size fits all. They work differently for different situations. So um, keep in mind, it, it's not like the last technique is the ultimate one and that's the only one you should use. Uh, they're all useful things. So my first and simplest technique is what I call isolation. And the idea here is to isolate the code that depends on something that's hard to mock and uh, then test kind of the rest of the code. <laughs> so it's, sli it's slightly unintuitive in that what you're isolating is actually the code that doesn't depend on your dependency. You move that out of your main control flow. You leave your, con your main control flow as calls to your hard to mock dependency and uh, calls to these helper functions. And then for the helper functions, you can write good tests because they're they don't have complex dependencies. They're uh, they're easy to write tests for just in the normal Go style. Um, and so you, you can end up with pretty good coverage. You end up with um, maybe actually a nicer structure for your code where you've factored out some helpers, and uh, you don't have to try and uh, test things that that actually call these dependencies that you're finding hard to mock. So I have an example, and, and my example is an HTTP handler. All my examples in this talk, I think, actually are, are uh, kind of network server handlers, because that's a really common thing to do in Go. I, my example for this one is this really insecure uh, HTTP handler that serves an arbitrary file from slash temp. Um, so you can see what it does is it gets the path from the request, uh, opens it, or checks it using stat to see whether it exists, whether it's a regular file. Um, if it does, then it opens it and it pipes the uh, contents of the file back to the client. So you can see it's using the uh, os.open call and the os.stat call. Uh, and these are both things from OS, which, like we said, is, it's hard to mock. There's no natural way to inject these dependencies unless you're going to have a bunch of function pointers. So we can, the nice thing is we can isolate those calls and we can test the rest of the code. So here I've refactored 
that function a little bit. You can see I've factored out a couple of uh, helper functions, which I'll put on the right. Um, I have the get path function that just extracts that path from the request. I have a, a function to check the return from os.stat and make sure that the, the file exists and, and is usable for me. And I have a, a function down at the bottom that you can barely see uh, that does the actual response to the client. Um, I factored that out. And so the code on the left is the part that we can't really test because it calls os.stat and os.open. Um, but the code on the right is all testable pretty easily. I, we can test right, kind of normal Go unit tests for it. And um, we don't have to do anything special for that. It doesn't have any dependencies. And the nice thing about the code on the left is it's, it's pretty simple. It's easy to read. You can kind of convince yourself that it works even without tests, um, which is, is an advantage. And just to get a sense of what the tests look like for the testable part, uh, here's, here's a couple of them. Um, I have success, a success case test and an empty path test for the, that get path function. Uh, on the right, I've written a kind of table-based test for that stat OK function. Um, and I've left out part of it, so if it's on the slide. But you can see we don't even have to use mocks here. It, it's a super simple, um, plain old Go unit test. And with just this technique, we get about 45% test coverage for our server code. Um, so it's, it's not great, but it's not bad. It's better than the zero we had before. And the only untested code is the stuff that actually directly calls those OS functions. So the trouble with that isolation technique is that it's like a bit of a cop-out. We're kind of cheating. We're, we're avoiding the problem entirely. Uh, we have some code that's hard to mock, and so we just don't test the code that calls it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the next technique is what I call wrapping, and that uh, actually lets us test the code that has uh, dependencies. So what, what we're going to do in this technique is um, build a wrapper for uh, the dependency. And um, this will let us use standard uh, mocking techniques, standard dependency injection uh, techniques like we saw earlier to write tests for the code. So the basic sort of process for uh, writing this wrapper is first we're going to create an interface. And that interface is going to have methods that match the functions we're using from the dependency. Um, <clears throat> then we're going to create a, a struct that implements that interface. And this is the struct that we're going to use in production. And it uh, just passes the calls right through the dependency, just calls them. So it's a, a really simple wrapper. Um, it, it's, it doesn't do anything special. Uh, we can tweak that wrapper a little bit. We can replace the return types with interfaces if we want. Um, that, will, that will let us uh, more easily produce mock response objects or mock return objects to return for our mocks. Um, we can also uh, write a more complex wrapper if we have complex return types that we don't want to deal with. Um, that, that adds a little bit of complexity in the wrapper, but it can make your test nicer. So it's, you kind of have to use your judgment as to like, where do you stop? You don't want to have to, you, you don't want to make your wrapper too, too complex, so make it just as complex as you need to. So here's our, our file server example again. Um, the, uh, in, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create uh, this interface that I call OS. And you can see it has a stat uh, method and an open method. And these have signatures that pretty much match the os.stat and os.open signatures. Uh, the only difference is I've replaced the return type of open with io.readcloser because we don't actually care that what we're getting back is an os.file. What we care about is that we're getting back something we can read and something we can close. So that io.readcloser uh, type satisfies what we need, and, and the os.file type satisfies that interface. Um, and you can see uh, my wrapper functions actually just straight call os.stat and os.open and, and return it. They're not doing anything special where I'm not doing any munging of the return types or, or anything. Um, all, it's, all it's doing is calling the dependency and returning. So that's, here's what our handler looks like now. You can see I've, I've made the handler uh, function now a method on a, a struct. And that's just so that I have somewhere to put my, uh, my dependency um, it, it, so that I don't have to pass it in every time. Um, the only difference in the code really is that rather than calling os.stat and os.open directly, I'm calling the versions from the wrapper. Um, so the, the wrapper lives in the handler, and we have h.os.stat and h.os.open. That's going to call the, the functions on the left there. And we can use mockery to generate a mock for that OS type. Uh, just like we did in our, our simple IP example, um, 
we can we can generate a mock and we can set up uh, mocks and, and write tests just like this. Uh, these tests work exactly like the ones that we saw before with mocks. We set up the calls that we expect to stat and open um, with our, our fake returns. We uh, can then use, uh, we can create a fake um, response writer using the HTTP test package. And we can call the, the handler, get the response back that we expect, and, and do some checks on it. Uh, we could even use the HTTP test server functionality to do a real end-to-end -end test, make actual HTTP calls, and see that we get back exactly what we expect. And we can get 100% test coverage this way. Uh, we can test the, all the code in that handler uh, using the mocks, the error cases, success cases, everything. So. I'll, uh, before I get to the next technique, a little bit of a diversion to kind of explain where it came from. Um, before I started working in Go, I worked in C for a long time. And uh, maybe contrary to popular belief, you can write unit tests in C, and you can use mocks in C. Uh, but C doesn't have interfaces, and it doesn't have classes, and it doesn't have structs with methods. Basically, if you're depending on a library in C, what you're calling is all free functions, um, which, like we said, are, are hard to mock in Go. Uh, so in C, we don't do dependency injection kind of the, the way that you do in object-oriented languages. The way that we uh, use mocks is with linker tricks. <laughs> we build an entire fake version of our dependency. And when we're linking our unit tests, we link against the fake version, so it gets called. When we're linking for our production code, we link the real version, so it gets called. Um, so when I came to Go and I saw that if I wanted to mock os.stat or os.open, I had to like write this wrapper and, and do all this stuff. That felt kind of awkward to me. It felt like a lot of work that uh, I shouldn't really need to do. I should just be able to write the uh, mock implementations of them and then have it sort of taken care of for me. Can I use a linker trick? And the answer I found was I couldn't really use a linker trick. Go just doesn't work that way, which is fine. Um, but with some clever tooling, at least I can get away from having to write so much wrapper code manually. Um, and this is, so this is, a uh, a technique that I like to use um, when I have something like the OS package where I'm just calling a couple of functions and I don't want to have to uh, produce that wrapper infrastructure. So this uses a tool that I wrote called mock package. And what mock package does is it works around this limitation that other Go mocking tools have of needing an interface to generate a mock. What it does is it you you tell it the package that you want to mock, the functions that you want to mock from that package, and it generates an interface internally. Um, and that interface that it generates has methods that match the functions that you want to mock. And then it uses mockery to generate a mock for that interface. It doesn't ever expose that interface to you. It's entirely internal to the, to the program. What it gives you is just a mock that uh, has the right methods in it. So we'll look at how it, how it works, how we actually use it. Uh, so I call this technique package mocking. Um, <clears throat> what we do is we create a variable for each of the free functions that we're going to call from our dependency. Uh, this could be an unexported package variable, or it could be a field in a struct, kind of depending what's most natural for, for your code. Um, we'll see it both ways in a, in a few minutes. Um, we're going to use mock package to generate mocks for those functions. And then you, in the real code, you assign the function variables to the real functions from the dependency. In your tests, you assign those uh, function variables to the versions from your mock. And this kind of uh, gives you, lets you use the mocks without having to write a wrapper. You're actually just calling the functions directly, albeit through a, a function pointer. So we'll see how it works in some code, because I know it's not a great description. So I have a new example for this technique. Uh, the reason I have a new example is that for the stat and open, I actually really like the wrapping technique because it lets us replace those return types. Um, the, the, uh, the return type in particular from os.open is complex, and so being able to swap it out for uh, an interface return type is really nice. You can't do that with mock package, at least at the moment. So uh, my new example is uh, another little HTTP handler. This one returns uh, the time or returns the time since the time that you pass in. So it's, you can see it's calling uh, time.now and time.parse. Uh, so in this case, our dependency is the time package. And this code is pretty much impossible to test effectively, because you don't know what time.now is going to return. It's not deterministic, right? Depends when you run it. Um, so we could uh, wrap the time package here, just like we saw before. There's nothing preventing us from doing that. 
But that feels like, to me at least, feels like overkill. It feels like we're writing a lot of code there that we shouldn't need to write just to uh, mock out these two functions that are pretty simple. So we can use mock package for this. So I'm going to tell mock package that I would like a mock of the time package. And the three functions that I want it to mock are now, since, and parse. Uh, you can leave out the, the functions, and it will actually generate a mock for all of the free functions in the package. Um, but in this case, since I only have three, uh, I'm going to tell it the three that I want specifically. It generates some code that looks like this. Uh, this looks a lot like the generated mock that we saw earlier. And again, we don't really care about the details, so I've left them out. But the interesting thing is it says, time is an auto-generated mock type for the time type. And you'll notice that we never defined the time type. The time type is what was uh, generated by mock package internally. And then it called mockery on it uh, itself. So it's uh, a completely generated type that's, that's never exposed to us. But what we have is this, this mock time. And it has our three uh, methods, now, parse, and since, that match the uh, signatures of os.now, os.parse, and os.since. So here's the, the how I change the time server to use this. You can see I have now three uh, package level variables called now, since, and parse time. And in our normal kind of production code, I'm going to set them to time.now, time.since, and time.parse. Um, if I was doing this in, in real life, I would probably create a struct and make those fields in a struct just so that they're a little bit more uh, hidden. Uh, pa having package level globals makes me a little bit nervous, but for a simple example, it, it works fine. You can do it either way. Um, and the only change that's necessary now to my uh, server code here is rather than calling uh, time.now, time.parse, and time.since, I call the, the versions that I've def uh, defined locally. And here are our tests. Uh, you can see, since we're using package variables, I, I use an init to uh, set, the, set those package variables to the mock versions. Um, the first thing I have to do is, is create this mock struct, and then I can assign the, uh, those three variables to the methods of that mock struct. And after that, I, other than that, these tests look just like uh, normal tests that use mocks. You can see that we set up the uh, mock time dot uh, now and the mock time dot since and mock time dot parse uh, have them do what we expect. Uh, we're using totally standard mocking other than the fact that we have these package variables. So that's um, that's that technique. The final one I want to talk about is, like I mentioned, these techniques can be combined and composed. For because if you have a complex application, uh, you probably it's probably not you're probably not going to be able to use the same technique everywhere. You're going to have to use multiple of them to uh, deal with different dependencies or to uh, structure your code nicely. So this is not uh, a separate technique, but just um, one way that you can combine them that I've found to be useful. So something I've found to be useful when I have a uh, dependency that's hard to mock is to build a higher level wrapper package for that dependency that does exactly what I need rather than exposing sort of the full richness of the dependency to the rest of my application code. Um, that isolates the, the calls to that dependency in a single package. And within that package, I can use my isolation technique to test kind of the business logic parts and not necessarily need to test every single call that I make to the dependency. Then I can uh, use mock package to mock that higher level wrapper package. Um, or, or I can uh, use standard mocking techniques, depending on how it, that package is structured. Um, and I, in, my, in the packages that depend on my wrapper package, I can use uh, normal mocking techniques. So I don't have a, a fully worked example for this one. I, instead, I wanted to show some uh, real code from a real service that I worked on recently at work. Um, we have an RPC server that we built on the our storage team that deals with disk formatting. So it has uh, RPCs that, you, that other services can call in order to format a drive or find out about the formatting on a drive. Uh, and here's a portion of the server struct. And you can see I, it has uh, three variables in it uh, that are function variables, has file system, MKFS, and format info. Um, and these three uh, variables are set to packages, or set to functions from uh, another internal package called FS. And FS abstracts away all of the uh, os.exec uh, 
and uh, os.open calls that we need to do to actually look at uh, the disks and, and see how they're formatted or to format them. Um, so we mock out, we, we isolate that uh, code that touches the OS package in the FS package, and then we can mo uh, mock that helper package uh, using mock package. So here's a couple of snippets from that from the FS package that I mentioned. This is where we have uh, some isolation. Um, we have an MKFS command that uh, we would assign to that MKFS variable on the previous slide. And you can see it uh, calls a function called MKFS command, which returns the uh, command line that it's going to call. And then it just passes that into os.exec.command, uh, runs the command, and, and checks that it uh, doesn't return an error, et cetera. Same for um, finding out formatting info. It's going to uh, call a, a command and then parse the output of the block ID command. And so these helper functions, the MKFS command function and the parse block ID output function, those I can write normal tests for. Um, I can cover all of the cases in them, et cetera. And then these functions I pretty much leave untested, like I, I did in the, the earlier isolation example. Um, they, they're really pretty simple. They're, they're getting the command to call and then calling it. So they're uh, pretty simple things to, to leave untested. And I should say the OS exec package is um, a really hard one to mock. It, uh, its functionality is uh, just such that it's hard to construct the return types. It's very hard one to, to mock up. And I should say, with this combination of uh, wrapping and isolation and, and mocking out the package, the uh, RPC server that I showed on the previous slide has about 95% test coverage. It's, it's very well covered. And this FS package that uh, actually does the command calls has about 50% coverage. So it's uh, reasonably well covered. All the kind of business logic parts of it are covered. Uh, without applying these techniques, that I couldn't get anything near that uh, level of coverage on this package. So before we're done, I just want to spend a few minutes recapping the techniques, and I want to talk about some pros and cons of each one, because there are trade-offs between these to keep in mind. Like I said, they're not one size fits all. So thinking back to the first technique of isolation, um, the nice thing about this technique is that it's very low overhead. You're not writing any extra code just for test purposes other than your tests. And it allows for pretty decent coverage. Um, it also might uh, actually improve the structure of your code. It kind of forces you to factor some things out. Um, putting some logic into their own functions anyway so that you can test them. Uh, and that's, that's nice for your code anyway. On the downside, it's kind of, a, it's kind of sweeping the problem under the, under the rug. Uh, you get some coverage, but you're not covering the part that actually calls your dependencies. So that part is untested. And the refactoring that you have to do um, might not be natural. Uh, like in my example, I actually factored out a two-line function that uh, just uh, writes a response to the, to the HTTP client. And like, I wouldn't factor that out except for test purposes. It, it, it's not really a natural thing to, to factor out. So that's um, kind of a, a, a downside. It, the structure that it imposes on your code might not be uh, normal, might not be what you'd end up with otherwise. For our wrapping technique, <clears throat> the nice thing about it is it allows us excellent coverage. It lets us use standard dependency injection and mocking techniques and all the good tooling associated with that, like mockery. Um, and like isolation, it can help your code structure because you have to abstract away your dependency a little bit. And in general, building abstractions for your dependencies is a good thing uh, anyway. So it's a, a nice uh, kind of structural improvement for your code. The downside is that it adds some indirection, and that indirection can be confusing. Um, you have to kind of jump through a couple of layers to see what's actually being called. Um, and that extra layer can also introduce a performance hit, especially if you're switching around return types, you're doing some extra work that you wouldn't have to do otherwise. Uh, and the wrapper structures that you write are not tested as well. Um, so you have this wrapper code that's calling your hard to mock dependency code. And it would be easy to have a simple bug here. For example, if you copy and paste and you forget to change a function name, you could have two functions that are actually calling the same function from the underlying dependency. And you're not going to catch that until production, because those functions are just inherently not tested. Um, and like with isolation, it can be a little unnatural to introduce an object where there wasn't one before, just for test purposes. Finally, on to the package mocking. Um, the nice thing about this is it gives you excellent coverage. Um, it, it limits the amount of code that you have to add just for test purposes. Uh, you don't have those untested wrapper functions because they're generated, sort of generated for you. Uh, and it, there is still some indirection, but it's not quite as much as in the, uh, the wrapping technique. It's a little bit easier to see what's being called. <clears throat> 
The downside is this is a, a pretty non-standard thing to do in Go. It might confuse other developers. Um, so it, sticking to kind of standard mocking techniques is nice. Um, there's also still potential for, uh, I don't know if I mentioned on the previous slide, that this wrapper can introduce a performance hit since you're doing extra function calls. Um, you can still end up with that here. In fact, uh, I've learned that if you uh, call a function through a function variable, it, the compiler will not inline that function call. So depending on what you're calling, that could be a, a performance impact. Um, and there's, there's potential for bugs where those uh, function variables get set incorrectly somewhere, uh, change during execution, those bugs would be really hard to find. So that's kind of a, a potential problem with this. And that's all I have for today, which is good, because I'm out of time. Uh, I think we do have a few minutes for questions, so thanks. <laughs> and I have a URL here for the code, all the code from the examples today. Um, I have not populated that repository yet, though, so look in a few days, and I will have code there. Thanks. Yes, we, we, we have some minutes for some questions, if you have. All right, we've got a couple training. of minutes if anyone's got okay. questions. All right. I'm not sure if I missed it. Thanks for the talk, by the way. I'm not sure if I missed it, but uh, you didn't mention one technique uh, for the icon has IP example, which would involve like passing in custom transport or custom round trip. Was there any reason why you want to avoid it, or was it just not intentional? No, I I, I think like it. Um, so that like that's a very standard dependency injection and mocking way of doing things, and I, I guess I I probably didn't say that. If you can get away with doing that, then you should always do that. It, the, oh, okay. the, the less trickery you have to do, the better. It's, um, if you have a natural way to inject dependencies, then, then use it, for sure. Cool. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. So just a question. Do you usually try to strive for 100% code coverage? Or do you just like separate on, on a basis, on some sort of a basis? Because the question is, uh, I like to use the isolation, and I usually don't use the, you know, the, the I don't test the part that I'm calling the external dependencies, mm -hmm. because it's usually just a function with, you know, three or four lines of code that are in that order. So I don't feel like I need to test it. Maybe on a bigger team, that's 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 a big issue. So you know, the question is, do you draw a line someplace, or do you just go for 100 percent? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I. I don't go for 100% code coverage. I think that can actually be detrimental depending on, if you can end up writing bad tests that give you 100% coverage. Um, and like you said, it's a, it's a trade-off. You have to decide whether there's enough value in writing the test. Um, if it's a really simple like one-line thing, then it's probably not worth writing, uh, yeah, writing tests for. So I, yeah, All definitely right. a good thing to keep in mind. It's a trade-off. All right, thank you. OK. Thank you so much. <clears throat>